Today, we're here with Glenn Lickman, CEO and co-founder of Encompass Surveys. We're going to talk all things surveying and get into the technology and the advancement in surveying over the last few years. Glenn, welcome. Could you just tell us a little bit about yourself and Encompass, please? Morning, Jeremy. Yeah, thanks. Um, my name's Glenn, obviously, from Encompass, co-founded in 2005, um, after 10 years of being a, a surveyor or a land surveyor with DTS, Digital Terrain Surveys. Um, I, I start, the reason I got into surveying was slightly uh, extended, but I wanted to be a pilot for British Airways. Did everything I wanted for that. Thought I got the qualifications, thought I had everything. Filled in the form, phoned up. Yeah, Mr. Lickman, all the way went through. Yeah, what height are you? I said, 194. Yeah, sorry, you're too tall to join the British Airways scheme. Okay, so the life dream gone. Okay, what do we do next? Okay, um, I was all right at maths at school. So I thought, well, I'll do something maths related. Went to be an accountant. I started to be an accountant, trainee accountant. Didn't like it for a couple of reasons. And then my mum and me found, uh, we saw a programme, I think it was South Today or something ridiculous. But it was on TV, there was a guy walking around the fields. He had a clipboard. He had his flask, he had his lunchbox. And it looked like his job was to walk around the field, do that, have his cup of tea, go home. Sounded great. Didn't think much more of it. And then my mum told me that she applied for a job on my behalf <laughs> for this surveying company as a trading surveyor. And um, went for it, got it. Uh, three guys that started at OS. So they got lots of experience. That's all in the survey, which are the yeah. you know, national map makers of the country. Um, and that was it, really. So I started it, loved it, outdoor life, blah, 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 blah. 10 years later after doing it, uh, fancied sort of thinking I could um, give this a go sort of myself uh, and with Steve Hall, my business partner, who uh, now. Um, and that was it. And so we took the plunge and went for it. So you got your mum to thank then? Yeah. <laughs> so so talking about a compass then, mm -hmm. so um, in, in the world of surveying, what type of practices are com uh, encompass? Okay, so we are, we've we been given a sort of more technical word, I think, geospatial, yeah. which just really encompasses uh, everything about the geoid, the earth, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 anything on the land mass, really. So we're surveyors of as-built assets. So it's like your fields for topographical, buildings for measure building, um, utilities to the underground, pipe work and, and, and connections and that sort of stuff. So basically we're map makers, essentially. We require the data of what is there now. And that can obviously carry on through the duration of your project, but we will create your as built. So if people want floor plans prior to making some changes, so that would be your architects, um, utilities to see where you are ready for um, construction or connections um, and the measure building for loads of multi aspects. Really. So it's, it's, it's to get the data now to give you the right information for any project going forward. So whether you're a construction architect, local authority or project manager, that gives you the data um, for your project for the whole duration going forward. So we're, we're data acquirers, really. Okay, that's interesting. And for those watching the video that um, might want to get into surveying, what's the what's the process of becoming a surveyor and, and the type of qualifications one would look for? Well, I did it without any, actually, at the start. So when I was a trainee, and that still applies massively to this day. So we've got an ongoing training and apprenticeship programme where a lot of the, the training is in-house. I do have an HNC qualification in civil engineering that forms some basis when I was at the previous company, mm -hmm. but you can start with nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, we normally like aptitude. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you understand maths, that's handy because it's geomatic, so angles and distances. But the beauty is with this technology advancement that we'll probably speak about later is that a lot of that is done for you. Mm -hmm. Although we still do a bit of Pythagoras work and I can talk about a bit of the old school stuff, should you so wish. Um, you can start with nothing. Clearly, if you are, you can get a degree in um, land surveying. I think there's only two courses left from a where UCL and one in Newcastle. I think that might be stopping. But a lot of it's that in-house skill that is passed down and the work processes and this, that and the other. So, um, Samantha University actually just started a geospatial um, master's, I think. And so you can come in at any level, is what yeah. I'm saying, really. Um, but basically, anybody that is what we're finding is that not sure what they want to do. Um, we're getting some word of mouth from the guys and girls that are with us at the moment because they've got friends that they're not sure what they want to do. And actually, this sounds quite cool. So, and when you're at school, I don't even remember when you were 
the uh, the careers advice or the careers mm-hmm. things you go to. Well, you're either going to be a, a fireman or insurance or banking or a nurse, aren't you? So yeah. that's or a pilot or a pilot. <laughs> I didn't even say that. Sadly. <laughs> but you know, you don't get that much choice, and you yeah. don't. It's only when you get older you realise what industries around there. You know, whether you want to be a, a diver or you know a cat food tester or you know a survey. You don't get told these things. Yeah. And actually, the reason I have done it for so long is because I loved it. Mm-hmm. So you've got some outdoor working. Be a nice balance between out and sight and then in the office. So, and now with the technologies, the advancement of the drones, the 3D modeling, the visualization of the scanners, um, the underground GPR, it's sort of endless. So it captures anybody. So even the guys that have been here longer, you know, I'm the oldest in the company by quite a margin, but all this technology coming through, it's interesting and you're using it for a purpose. And because of the skill and actual the geospatial to do it correctly is valued um, by lots of people. Um, although not valued necessarily by everybody at the moment, is that what a great job it is. And I will still say to this day, I absolutely love every day. My job has changed because I'm not a surveyor day in, day out anymore. And so it's running the business and business development and things. But still coming in, if you're coming in and you're traveling the country and you're doing some stayovers or traveling abroad, which we do as well, being on site two, three days a week, bit of office, you know, bit of pool table or dartboard or gym or whatever that you know we, we've got at ours that they can use it's a great environment you can use your brain it's great um, to build friendships and relationships as well but it's in a growing industry and I, I don't think there's any industry that I'm aware of that is so fast in technology you know when I was started you, you know taping distos the electronic yeah. measures you know it was, it was that big when I first started we called it the brick affectionately known as and when we started it was two man teams there was no electronic distance measurement well there was just started electronic distance measurement but you needed prisms to reflect the laser back whereas now you've got lasers that reflect themselves back so called reflectless and that's why you get one man um, bits of kit that you can walk around with a prism and it follows you and stuff like that so things have changed scanners as we said the drones and all the other bits and pieces that we'll probably get into so really exciting industry so we rule nobody out we are very diverse it's just a brilliant industry. So if you're not sure what you want to do, if you're not sure what your kids want to do, or your friends' kids or whatever, try geospatial. Because it's going places and we need youthful, vibrant people that are going to come in and take it the next step. So all the guys in our place have given license to develop new workflows and this technology here and this technology, how can we deliver it? Because ultimately we're in the delivery business. You know, it's what the client wants, is what we need to be delivering. We're trying to create some workflows and some deliverables that they're not even aware of that haven't even been developed yet. But fundamentally, we need people to use these technologies, softwares, and skills to give the client what they want. Because it's moving so fast. And again, we, we talk about AR and other stuff further down the line. But what a brilliant industry that you can help shape it. And especially within our business that everybody's got license to do that. What a great promotion for uh, for for uh, a career in um, surveying. I think what's really interesting there is there's no barriers. No. So the entry ba- there's no entry barriers. So so anyone can get into it, gain experience, train, and and maybe gain qualification if in if in, in even indeed needed. Absolutely. Yeah. So in terms of qualification, yes, you don't need anything necessary to come in. So you, you come in as a trainee sort of level or apprenticeship level. Um, you know, everybody's probably heard of RICS. Mm-hmm. Uh, we um, are CICS, Chartered Institute of Civil Engineering Surveyors. Right. So that's more appropriate for the geospatial, uh, we feel. So um, Steve's a member of the CICS, and anybody within the business, as they accrue experience, uh, we will put onto the scheme if they want to do that. And that gives them really the industry-wide top qualification. Uh, RICS is still relevant for someone who's got it. So Rob, our head of surveyance, got a RICS. But the, the CICS is really most relevant. So the beauty is that wherever you start, you can attain that um, UK-wide or uh, internationally renowned qualification of the CICS and accreditation, personally and also as a business. So there is no limits to what you can achieve. There's various um, qualifications you get within it. If we talk about the utility guys, so you need a level three to be a utility surveyor, but obviously we put them on a level four, level five. And now in the industry, what I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but it's a, a Puma accreditation for the PAS surveys. So it's the utility PAS standard. Yeah. They even want to improve that, and the TSA is sort of running that element. 
So it's accreditations for the company, but there's loads of different qualifications you get. So it's not like you get trained in-house and that is it. As you've got the experience and you get the knowledge from us and follow the processes and the workflow and do all your CPDs and all get all your marks and go to the Geo Show, you're building your qualifications with it. So it's a proper career for anybody that wants to do it. So you've touched on some of the services that Encompass offer, but um, could you just sort of delve a little bit more into that? You know, you talked about you know geospatial, land surveyors, you talked about um, topographical. Just just give us a flavour of the type of surveys and how wide they might be. No problem. So fundamentally what we started with historically was topographical, or topos as people call them, and measure building. So it's your floor plans, your elevations. So that was, that was the core of what we started with. And as things have developed and technologies and actually us wanting to offer more services to the clients. It's more of a one-stop shop, whether it be the developers, so we can do the other bits. So primarily what we do is topo, measure building, and that includes the HDS that we'll talk about. Uh, the utility, which is the underground, so that's the tracing of the services and connections. Uh, CCTV now, which supplements the utility, so when you look at the conditions of pipe work and restoration and patch repairs and that sort of thing. Uh, we undertake 3D modeling, which is BIM, which yeah. I know you're involved with. Uh, and we've got a UAV department that do various aspects of um, visualization, imagery, but primarily for orthographic photos overlaid with topos and also to fill in the point cloud element. The other service we, te uh, we offer is uh, three, um, not 3D energy, surveying engineering. So that's when we would set out certain elements, uh, on the building sites, it could be for a, you know, a sanity check on it, which we do a lot of weekly checks for the mm. clients and that sort of thing. So any of the setting out for the piling rigs, that sort of thing, uh, building corners, uh, anything like that, uh, clash detection, that sort of thing. So I think it's seven things really. Topo, measure building, utility, CCTV, 3G, 3D modeling, UAV and engineering. Sorry if I've done that as well. No, that's fine. I mean, that's that's quite a, a vast array of um, surveys and services that you offer your clients. So, thinking about those, um, what what type of challenges does Encompass or surveyors currently face in the built environment? Ooh, it's quite. There's a few. Mm -hmm. um, Technology is one, so it's keeping a handle on developments really and making us relevant and providing, as we said, to the client element side of it. I think some of it's sort of education because it's uh, lots of people been in the industry, whether it be architects, again, project managers, local authorities that, you know, traditionally oh, we just get the topo guys in. So, uh, and that's then just the guys with the tripods that walk yeah. around the fields and actually not understanding that what else is available now. So some of that is just thinking we're not being used for the right things or necessarily all the things that we can do with it. I think we have a staff issue in terms of, as everybody does, you know, getting quality staff in, experienced staff. I think that's a real issue. The trainees are sort of okay because there's there's tends to be quite a few. We've managed to hook them by the fact it's quite a nice, well, it is a great job to, mm -hmm. or an industry to be involved in. But that experienced pool of talent, that we've used the bulk of it, I think, in the very local sense. And even with our other office in Essex, it's very difficult to find experience. So we're having to find ways around it and make sure our trainee program's tightened and that conveyor belt keeps working. Clearly a cost element um, in terms of, you know, the, the race to the bottom that I think we've all been involved with from time to time. You know, the people have been either desperate for work so they reduce the prices or there's... And this is where the, the technology can become half an issue that lots of people will start up and create their own business and, you know, very much good luck to them because, you know, that's what we did. So there's nothing against that, but because there's so many people in the market at that level, they can do a topo. Mm -hmm. And clearly they can do it probably cheaper than we can because they don't have the overheads, the office, you know, the, the kit, the accreditations, et cetera, et cetera, and the PI cover that mm -hmm. needs millions of pounds of cover and liabilities and that sort of thing. So we're finding that a lot of our clients, again, that can be architects, project managers, were asked to quote or provide a quote. We might be one of three. Mm -hmm. And we understand that's the business in a lot of cases. We're missing out sometimes on price point, but price only, not on the services. Yeah, we offered more services, but the client wants to go over the price. You know, we recommended you, but the client wants to go over the price. You know, it's you know exactly what that's like. That 
a lot of our clients are intermediaries for their clients. Mm. So it's actually trying to get them to understand if they can nicely educate their client. Actually, sometimes it pays to go for the, va the real value product that offers that value all the way through all the additional services or you know, access to um, expertise, capacity, um, and that sort of thing. So cost is... Uh, pressured, I think. You know, everybody's got the supply cost issues and all the other bits and pieces. Costs have gone up. You know, energy's gone up. Um, you know, we've got more people. We need a larger office, so we we suffer those bits. So effectively, it's you know, pricing really. I think mm. we just notice that there's a little bit people just going for the cheapest a little bit. Yeah. Um, staffing is the big one, and then the technologies to make sure we are providing the right deliverables for the client and for what they want. But that's why we discuss, we see ourselves as geospatial consultants rather than just land surveyors is because we want clients say, like Evolution uh, or Mace or Architects to use us as, we've got expertise. Mm. So use that as a relationship. Relationships are a massive thing for us. If we can build them, I think we can overcome some of these things because people then understand what we add sort of to the whole project or to the company or to their clients and stuff from that. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. It's a value proposition, not not a cost proposition. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I was thinking about when I asked the question was around, and it, and it might be my lack of understanding, but one of the things I was thinking about was um, some of the equipment you use, and I, I can imagine some of that being really expensive, um, and there being quite large capital costs. Does that create any challenges in terms of payback or? if you're an established business actually not so much but maybe for startup businesses yes <laughs> <laughs> was that a close question <laughs> sorry <laughs> yes it's expensive anything in surveying is expensive if i get a pen with a surveying company name on it then it's expensive it's yeah. just it always seems to be the nature <laughs> of the beast that's part of the problem with technology is that clearly if you're an early adopter it's expensive so you've got to find you know what it's budget and you've got to see the, the payback time it's the value for it. We say we could get this, we could do that, we could do this, we could do that. Well, we could do. We could buy every bit of equipment going, but actually the client's only going to pay X. And even as a value proposition, there's still a limit to what you can charge. So it is quite difficult. We picked our moment actually when we went into HDS scanning. So scanning, uh, predominantly we're a Leica follower. So we were using P-Series, but you know, it's expensive kit. It's like 90 grand. It's very heavy, very data intensive. So I mean, you needed a, you know, a NASA computer to operate it. But as time moves on, everything comes down a bit in pricing. You can use it with uh, less powerful computers and that sort of side. So it was picking our moment. Mm -hmm. So we weren't far enough forward at the time to go and buy lots of these things. But then it comes a moment when it is. So cost, yes, is an element. Obviously, you factor it over your, your four-year program or whatever. But when there's high-value items and you're operating in London or wherever, you've got a risk of theft. We've had three instruments stolen, and that was that was a massive thing, really. Because the point of us buying robotic, sort of geek you out a bit, but the reason of going robotic instruments, which is the, the, the total stations measuring the stuff, is that you only need one person, whereas traditionally it was two. So to become more efficient, you can buy a one-man bit of kit, only have one man operating, you're saving some costs, you can pass that to the client, but hopefully still make the, you know, that illegal thing they call profit. The snag with that is, is when, when you operate in London, or well, anywhere actually, it's not just London, but it is horrific in London, you leave a bit of kit 30 yards away and someone takes it. We were effectively mugged on one of them where uh, a car pulled up, two big fellas pulled out, bin bags over the registration plate and left our guy in no, in no doubt that the best thing for him to do would be to ignore what was happening and leave it be, which was the right instruction for our surveyor. Mm -hmm. But it's a scary moment. You know, that's a shock thing. You think, geez, how do we get around that? So that's a technology, so there's a cost, so you've got that element to it. Um, there's cost to software, but it is a necessity. You need this. You know, if we're going to move into, and a lot of this is moving into BIM. Mm. So all local authorities now have been tasked, you have to use BIM or Level 2 or 3D modelling and use that as a part. You can't do that just with a tape and distal or a single instrument. You need to produce a digital twin, which is what you get from the HDS scanners. Mm. So we need to be relevant, which we feel we are and then you just factor that in and again as long as we're offering value you can do it i mean drones they offer some there's some cost there but gpr for utility you know the stream dp isn't cheap but it offers such better results to the client so instead of being 
a meter, meter and a half, say down your foot path, you know, we're getting almost up to five meters of uh, data below ground. Mm. So clearly that's gonna enhance the product that you can supply because you can find pipe work further down. So if we aim to be the best of which we do, you know, within our area and within our industry, then we have to make sure we can produce the best results for the client. If we're not doing that and not investing, then we're gonna fall behind. Um, so we're, we're constantly looking at workflows and investment of it. You know, I always say that I make a joke of it, but it's like, it almost seems to be every other day someone's getting a Christmas present in, in Compass. It just never seems to be me. There's another thing to unwrap, you know. Uh, Dave or Disco, as I call him, you know, he gets, oh, yeah, Disco, there's another present you got, is it? Right, good, I'm glad it's working, glad it's helping you. Know, I need a new GPS, I need this, I need that. So, um, you know, we are relevant to that part, but we do yeah. budget and we do ask questions and cost benefit and all that sort of element to it. So there is a cost, but getting it right is key. Um, but it's a beauty of our industry. We're very lucky to have Leica and Trimble and all that trying to move it forward um, and develop it. You know, all the AR, AI. We just need to keep on top of it, really. You know, and people more intelligent than me, below me, will hopefully shape our future and pick the right moments to do use the technology, really. That's a really good, good insightful response, thanks. Um, mm -hmm. You touched on HDS, high definition scanning. Yeah. Um, for those who don't know the, the details of it, what is it and what's the benefits of it for the client? Okay, so that, as we touched into it, so it's transformed a bit, so just in old money, yeah, you used to have a tripod, if we were measuring this room or the corridor or the building, you'd take a, get a laser, take a single shot, and you would just measure the walls and then you add to it with a tape and disto. So it's quite time intensive, uh, and you can only get a limited amount of data. So if we went through this building here, we might have 100 points of control, we call it. Mm. These scanners now, high definition scanning, is that you know they can pick up to two million points per second. So it's astonishing, really. So it does a 360 scan, so if we're in this room, you would scan it. And you can have anything from scanning from seven seconds to a minute, depending on the density of points you require. So that then, again, you can make it all high density. But again, what does the client want to do with it? If you don't want a fire plan, you wouldn't be needing the high level of density. You know, what's the duration of the project? Is he going to use it for anything else? But effectively, what it's making is, this room would be half a billion points or something. So you can use it for anything. You can cut and slice then through it. And basically what you've got is a digital twin. So when we're talking about it, it's, it's of your asset. So let's just say you own a hospital or you run a hospital. What you can do is you, you procure a company to scan it, but hopefully with geospatial control, so or georeferencing data, so you use a geospatial specialist for it. So you would traverse around it, you, you use least squares adjustment or some, some mathematical software effective to tighten the quality of your grid. Then you'd scan it and get this adjusted to that grid. And then what you've got is this asset, this digital twin of what you own, what you use, and you can use that for almost ever in a day because that is getting the external and internal structure. Anything that the scanner can see, it will survey in essence. And then what mean, that means is you can then use that. It can be archived. So the easiest way to explain it is, uh, you know, Notre Dame, the cathedral in, in, in France that was burned down. It wasn't done professionally, but there was a guy that did it for a project that he scanned it inside and out. So HDS scanned it for a project. So when it burnt down, they had no record of what it looked like in the real world, real dimensions. So clearly they had photographs and this, that and the other, but they didn't have a model. They didn't have a digital twin. As luck would have it, some fella had scanned it for a project. So they could then use the data to then reconstruct the rebuilding of Notre Dame. But if you use that as an example, you can imagine then if you own National Trust properties or you uh, NHS and you've got 30 uh, doctor surgeries, or you're a council and you're at the civic centre and that sort of thing. Well, get it digitised using HDS scanning and a control network and a, a geospatial consultant, and then you've got it. So even if the internals change, or you're changing the partitions or your carpets, I think it's brilliant for that because that's how you can measure and schedule stuff. But what it means is if it does burn down, and that's a dramatic example, but actually you have got that as an asset that you can rebuild. But it's more that you've got that as a tool. You don't have to go back and re-scan it. You see what I mean? Yeah. Whereas if you task me, when I call it in the olden days, probably like five years ago, is to measure this the old school way, 
I'd measure what you tell me that you just needed via lease plan, sort of get enough data for that. But if you say, Glenn, actually, what I need is full detail on your um, suspended ceiling and where all your bits and pieces and where your light switches are, I'd have to go back for a revisit. Whereas actually, if you digital twin it now, you can access all that info because it's already there. So you can, you do not have to weigh out all the expenditure because actually it's a relatively cheap way is getting the digital twin. It's just how much you want to spend further down the line getting the Revit models or the, you know, the uh, 3D modeling aspect, or you want to see the sprinkler system or you want to see you know, what type of carpets. You, that can all be gathered from the digital twin. So that's where HDS is like, that was a game changer. There's been a few really, mm. but that was a major, major one for measure building or facilities yeah. management or development, redevelopment uh, and asset management really. You mentioned something there. You said, um, hopefully by a geospatial surveyor or engineer. So is that to suggest there's people out there who are using this equipment um, that are not qualified or perhaps, um, and what's the risks associated with that, I guess? Yeah, and sorry, I probably should have mentioned that earlier, but there's a real danger to it. So the scanning is, it appears very simple, which really is in terms of the equipment. So let's say we put the scanner down, you press the button, you tell it what settings you want, and it does the scan. It does all the millions of points. You don't have to do anything else. And then it will link what they call cloud to cloud. So it will find 25%, 30% of the data from the previous scan. That's what it needs. And it will link it to the next one. So there's software that will automatically, well, it does it sort of itself. There's software there that will tell you that that scan relative to the next scan is pretty good. So you've got one, two, three, four mil of error, and that will give you a green tick. And let's say from there to there, that scan to scan is great. So in essence, that sounds fantastic. And this is what a lot of this has been sold on. But the real risk and the danger is that it's the same with anything, you know this. It's dangerous in the wrong hands. So it appears simple. Surveying appears simple. I mean, brick laying appears simple to me, but Christ, I've tried it. Horrendous. Plastering seems simple, but it isn't. You need skill. You need. So a great example of this scan to scan danger really is the people that come in and say, yeah, well, we can do this for you. We can do that. Um, and if you haven't got the experience or the capability to use the total station, which is the geo referencing tool, link it to your GPS, tie it in, do your least squares adjustment and have a really tight fixed network is we could scan, let's say a school. Scan to scan is brilliant. So it's done, let's say, 400 scans. And every scan to scan is given a green tick on the software supplied by the, the, the company that supplies the hardware. Brilliant. Lovely. Fantastic. Let's draw it up. Great. You see the data. It looks fantastic. Cut a slice. Look brilliant. What you do is when you compare that to what we and other geospatial companies do is you georeference it. So you go around with a tripod. You put control points and you'll see black and white targets. This is what you do. And that's called control. So you have errors, you have drift if you're not careful. So this, this network around and through the building creates a tight structure for which to pin the scan data on. Now, without it, it's incredibly dangerous. And one example is that the scan data, so link, 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 all good, all green, but you can have, it will drift. So if you go corridor to corridor, so you, if you've got limited data to link to, it will still give a green tick because it's happy it's seen enough data but it will drift, so you'll see error, but you won't necessarily see it. But the biggest one that you've got is tilt. So it's got all the data, so in plan is fab. But you imagine a scanner's going there, it's not on a spirit level, it's just roughly done, it's got no IMU. So basically all your data might be on a tilt. Well, I'll exaggerate, so it's meant to be like that, let's say all these floor levels are perfectly on 10 meters. It's meant to be that, but it's gonna require all the data in green, but it's on a tilt. And we had one example when we didn't use the control was from a ground floor to a first floor, it was only a two-story building. The ground floor, and although it's quite an extreme example, it just shows it perfectly, was 50 mil lower on the ground floor and 50 mil higher on the first floor relative to our georeference control. So put that in the context, what you've got is an error of 100 mil between two floors, from the, the floor of the ground and the ceiling of the first. Does it matter? It's not for me to say really, but Clearly, I think it does. And if you're going to start designing steels, or the architect's going to design steels on it and other things, you don't want to be 100 mil out. But it looked right. Across the school, it didn't look like you had a massive error to start with. So that is dangerous. I know some 
practices that, oh, we've seen a scanner, a salesman come around, sell them a scanner because it's so easy, you know, so, so simple to operate. And yet what they don't realise is the danger of, you, can you imagine like then going to Reba and think, yep, ah, uh, why are you out? Well, we used the scanner. Yeah, but did you control it? Did you get a surveying company in? No, no, we did it ourselves. It was fine. It told us it was all good. Horrendous nightmare. I'm not saying there isn't a, a circumstance where you use it. I do know one architect's practice that they bought a scanner, happened to be a black 360 or BLK 360. And it's a good bit of kit. It will scan this room 400,000 points a second. And what they use it for is to um, look at the detailed corner things for listed buildings. If you're just doing a single room, I couldn't really argue that, no, you have to use a surveyor. Because again, I want to be in the real world. I want to tell people you have to use surveyor where it's not required. Mm. But actually, when you're starting to link it together, that's it's frightening. And this is where, as an industry and the, the good providers of quality surveys is we're trying to promote the best practice. That has to be the key. So again, what do you want to use it for? But I would warn people that want to go down their own route if they're not skilled surveyors to take a scanner and do drawings for their clients if they don't know what they're getting into because I'm sure they're not aware of the tilt, let alone the drift. And you can only imagine what errors you might have further down the line. So we promote best practice along with other companies like Terra and Academy Geomatics. And we're, you know, we speak to lots of other survey companies. We want to promote it. And that's what the TSA is for. So you're promoting best practice. That doesn't mean that one man bands can't do it because actually there's some brilliant ones that are doing best practice. But just beware if you've got guys that are specialists as drone, say, operators or anybody that was used to be a facilities management but decided to scan their own thing. Just be aware of what you might be getting and just question how they're doing it and have they got redundancies, have they got checks and this sort of stuff. So that's sort of probably another consideration when we're talking about issues in the built environment. It's just making sure people are using the right people to do the right job, really. Yeah. And it's always difficult because some people are more active or more um, vocal on these social media platforms, including LinkedIn, that they're very good at the social media element, but they haven't got the skill set behind it and they, they don't understand tolerances and errors and all that sort of side of it. So that's a difficulty as well. But sorry if that's a bit elaborate, but HDS and that's what it does for it. It was perfect. So there's been um, huge advancements in visualisation and modelling. Is this something Encompass do and get involved in? And if so, you know, tell us a bit about it. Yeah, that's, um, I think that's where the, the technology has come in. So it was the hardware with the, the scanners and the drones um, and even the phones, I suppose, really how that's moved on and some even LiDAR aspects to that. So again, when we talked about what we're going to give the client, it's, well, traditionally it was 2D plans. So how are we going to improve on that? You know, and COVID was a massive thing because everybody works from home, everybody's on Zoom. How can we convey it? You know, you'd want to see physical plots and that sort of side. So visualization was sort of a, a wake up that, crikey, actually, it's not just the COVID element, it's actually a really good tool anyway. And it was, although it was being used and adapted, it, it, it was a, a classic reason, it just sped that up. So there's quite a few different aspects we do really. I suppose the, the, the three bulk ones are uh, there's AR, augmented reality. So when we talk about digital twins, we've scanned this building and then if we've modeled it for BIM, so let's say we've done the MEP mm. up in the ceiling. So we've scanned it because we removed some tiles and we can do that. We can produce the model for it. And then when the client has put the ceiling back or they're gonna put in a, a proper ceiling, let's just say a hospital, the beauty is you know you can use your phones and then you can just use a QR code in the room it's not always necessarily the case, but then you can just look up and then you see everything that's there above the ceiling. So that's really cool. So it's a visualization thing. So if you're the owner of the project or the, the big boss has come down and he wants to see what's under there or whatever, that's what you do. You can do that. You can apply that then underground. So a, a big part of ours is that the reason utilities are often done is obviously it helps with the costing of the project, but it helps with the service strikes because that's a massive issue in construction. And the problem is we can do the survey of the utilities underground, um, but they're not seen. So it can be on a plan, but plans aren't, you know, I understand them, you understand them, and you know, plenty of people do understand, but they're not easy to convey. And that's why we do ortho photos with the, the drone stuff, so they can actually see it relative to that tree or that car parking space or, or whatever. 
But what it means that AR does is that if you're on site or you've got a subby in that's a ground worker, just say for the day or for the week, he's not aware of everything that's gone on. And because you've stripped the site, there's no markers left. If you use AR, and it can be in your cab, so on you know, these decent automated cabs and stuff, if you've got AR, you can see where the high voltage cable is or the gas pipe is underground. So if you need to dig around there, you know you've got more caution to do and you know be careful and just you know, do your little trowel to start with or whatever, and then your spade, don't just go straight in with the, the big old pickup. So that's a massive thing. So that helps reduce service strikes. It visualizes it for anybody on the ground with any qualification, any skill set. It just helps. It's not a magic wand, but again, it's another tool to aid in the health and safety, but also for anybody to any stakeholder within the project to see it, any aspect. So in terms of, that doesn't have to be the as-built or what's there now. If you've got the M&E guys that are gonna put in a new air conditioning system, they can see where it's gonna fit in or the client can see how that's gonna fit or how it's gonna to relate to the room because obviously it's more on trend to have it in the room. Well, how's it gonna look? And actually, Christ, it's gonna go through the window. That's clash detection. So you can see errors between the design and what limitations you've got within the room. So it's a brilliant bit. Um, bit of technology, constantly being developed to improve, but that's, that's a cool one, so that's the AR. Mm -hmm. The visual, visualization of the digital twin that we were talking about. So if we're scanning these rooms, what we can do is give links to you as the client to see it. So you could be on Zoom again with your client and the secretary and the tree guy or whatever, and then you can click on the scans and you can pan around the room. Because the density of the points is so huge, it's like having a photo. Mm. So maybe you just pan around. You can even get walkthroughs, fly-throughs, that sort of thing. But you can also take basic measurements. So if you literally just want to see what the room width was or the height was, even if we're providing a BIM model or 2D floor plans, it's still good for the client or any of the stakeholders to actually see it in the real world. Wow, this is really mm. cool. You can then supplement that with VR. So that's the virtual reality aspect of it as well. So you can do that with your Revit modeling. I think you've all seen it. We can produce it for that, but sometimes the client does that themselves. But essentially we provide a digital twin that allows that to happen, but we've got VR. So that's the second one, which is the visualization of the data that we've acquired, so the digital twins. And the third one is with the drone element. What that's really managed to do is fills in the gaps in terms of point cloud data. So whatever the scanner can't see from the ground, it can't survey. So what the drone does, it goes up to the sky, it can do it, can do the point cloud stuff. But what we found is really useful for a couple of our clients, but um, the biggest one that most people know would be the National Trust, is that we've been asked to do a drone or UAV survey of some of their roof. Rather than either get a cherry picker or a scaffolding, we go up, use high definition, which is great as a visualization. So it's not surveying as such of that part, but because it's linked to our bits for the point cloud stuff, it's great, but it can just be visualization. What happens is what you can do is that when you fly it and you look at a chimney stack or you look in uh, some lead work, that can be live fed to anywhere. So uh, I think it was our park house where we were. We were undertaking a drone survey. The structural engineer that they had was up in Scotland but he was getting a live feed to what the drone operator was doing. And then he could say, go back, go go here, go there. Oh, can, I, can you zoom in? Can you do whatever? So actually you didn't need everybody to attend site. You just needed a, an a approved operator to be able to operate it, and he can send live link HD feed. Obviously subject to signal, but essentially most places have got signal now, and you can send a feed. And then you're getting real time feedback. And what that enables us to do is that if we've missed a bit or the client wasn't aware, but actually, oh, I just saw that, can we go and look at something else? You can do it there and then, but you didn't need to travel from Scotland. So what a wonderful additional tool that is. So that, you know, again, that just anything we can do to assist the client. So there's three different tools we probably didn't have a few years ago, but now you can see, you know, as a client that that helps because you can see it in the real world. It's not just a 2D floor plan. You're getting so much more now with the data that we can acquire. It can be in color, it can be in black and white, it can be however you want it. And that's, I suppose, the joy is that there's lots of clients that don't really even know that all these things exist and actually how ultimately that will benefit them and their clients because you think, wow, once you've seen it, you think, that's cool. You know, there's, there's loads of people that can operate that, and especially the drone, the drone guys or specialists, they can do that as well. But in terms of geospatial, we can do all three aspects and hopefully that helps the client and actually the, the people that end up paying for the, 
the job and the end user really that's some really fascinating stuff there and and as you say you use the word cool some pretty cool uh, yeah. cool bit gadgets a bit of equipment um we, we've talked a lot about you know um all the different type of surveys from topo measure surveys the scanning you know and although not necessarily um survey as such but you know with the drones until it's obviously then linked back to other data that you're using but as a client or as a recipient of the information one thing you want to know is what checks and balances are in place what qa is in place to make sure that the the data that's being provided is accurate and and the equipment that's being used is calibrated and accurate you know how what's that side of things look like yeah so naturally the kit needs to be calibrated so which they are and it's obviously service and you've got a calibration certificate normally yearly uh, you look for checks anyway, so even if it's the spirit level on the, uh, the surveying pole that you'd use, so you know you don't trust it implicitly forever and a day, so you get that regularly calibrated, which is in the office, in terms of the, uh, the scanners and the total stations, that goes to specialists to be calibrated every year. So that's the general default, that clearly you need to have that done uh, all the time to make sure you've got a kit that is fit for purpose, that then that means you can follow the rules of uh, skill in, in the survey. So we've got the kit that works, great, it's approved, it's calibrated, lovely. One of them is technique, so there's a technique for going around a bit. So if I talk traversing, all I mean is, is if you're going around, let's say, a field that you're going to build on, and there's roads all the way around it, you will traverse around it, which just means you're going to move around it with your tripods. If you do that, there's still a skill in that. So you want the relative angle and distance to be as similar as possible. What you don't want is two tripods to be one meter apart and then suddenly have 150 meters apart. That's not good practice. That's not best practice. So you're looking for consistency. You're looking for where possible angles to be consistent. So when you do the adjustment or when a computer does the adjustment, it's adjusting it properly throughout. Sometimes you've got limitations and you've got, you've got, be, you've got to be aware of that. So if you're having to do three short setups, you've got to be aware that there's potential risk of error there. So you put some redundancy in with it. You would cross brace it so you go across the field at least twice mm. and that ties in with your outside control and then it will help adjust that and tighten it a lot so traversing and that's massively important and on construction sites so once we've done the survey or any geospatial company's done the survey what we'd recommend is that when you're ready to build or you put the hoardings up you know you've normally got nails around the outside which is your survey control mm. what normally happens is there's two nails left out there and the engineer will hook into the site and then set out his uh, grid lines or whatever. The snag is what tends to happen is that if there's another engineer next week, he'll come off the same two nails and come in. So what we're recommending, again, whoever's done the, the topo, we'd probably recommend they come in, do the control network. So the engineer would use the nails or the existing outside control, come in, then put their control network, say 50 retro targets and some permanent markers and this, that, that and the other for redundancy. And then for the duration of the project, what we recommend then is the, the company that are building, whether it be in the site manager's office or again, QR codes next to the, the retros, is the QR code straight to an Excel file or a CSV so that any engineer, whatever software they're using, access have access to those 50 control points. So you're consistently using it. You've got error with the two stations outside because if you two mill out one on each nail but the other way to previous, by the time you swing in 150 metres or 120 metres in sight, you could be 40 mil out. That's no fault of the engineer that's done it, but if every engineer has got different errors in their equipment and calibration and even the parallax and stuff, you've got errors. Mm. So from no fault of anybody really in particular, you can have an error of 30 mil, 40 mil on site if you're consistently getting people to come from outside in, hence why you do control errors. So the technique is one. So that's another aspect of the skill and have quality control. We mentioned on it is the least square, so you, again, it's that mathematical software. I mean, in the old day and whatever, you'd have to do it yourself, but fortunately we don't have to, mm. but you run it through the program a couple of times. So you've got some redundancy on that part. When you also do the topo, as well as the control network, what you do is you survey other points away from that, and every time you go back, as well as trusting the control network, you try and use those off points, points off site. Mm. Again, sanity check. If you take that up to the drone level, and this is really the most important one, I think, or as important as this technology moves, people fly drones, and then almost all drones now have got RTK, which means it's got a GPS positioning, so it roughly knows where it is. 
it can produce a it uses photogrammetry it takes 500 pictures say of 2d photo photos and it will mesh it together to create a 3d model amazingly clever bit of software whether it be pix4t or agisoft or other softwares out there it's amazing looks fantastic again you've got a spoil heap brilliant the snag is in our experience especially in the early days so you fly it you allow it to do the spoil heap create its own model without any other form of control twofold when we now do it is that you can either use straight GPS which basically means in real terms you walk around with a pole that is establishing global positioning technology to come in tell you where you are within a tolerance generally if you're using it on the same day or the same hour in the real world it's relatively accurate but at any point you, you're going to have a you cannot expect any better accuracy than 25 30 mil so you've got some error there that might be fit for purpose actually for the massive cut and fill but what you have is flare so if you've got no control so that that main part of the site is good it looks good it look you've got a point cloud it looks like how you think it was going to look but the quality of your information is flaring out so when we did some test control things it, it looked great you thought oh well that point is 500 mil out relative to our ground control point let me just check that you know we just think is it that kidding what you realize is it, i'll say this for most people there is no magic wand in any of this stuff so drone is fab it's brilliant rtk is great photogrammetry software is awesome hds is magnificent the scanners are all brilliant as well but it's not a magic wand if you don't know what you're doing and so people expect it well i can just do that I just you know it tells me it's there it's there and it tells me that's the volume so that is the volume well not necessarily so this is where we control it you can control it with gps or we would establish a gps point for a point of reference establish a bearing and then we go around using the total station again not to bore anybody but essentially it's angles of arc so the whole point of a total station it's got 360 degrees the reason you spend quite a lot of money on it you can you can do it to five seconds of arc or one second of arc but the one is really accurate so if you're traversing a lot you've got one second of arc which is really really tiny but imagine if you stretch the error a bit the further you go on a traverse let's say a kilometer and you're using a five second instrument you've got error larger error so we're using decent equipment traversing around it adjusting it and then creating then you can use the drone to do the spoil heaps safer than what you were going to walk up it you know and all that sort of stuff which is traditional i'm not saying it's not fit for purpose without fully controlled uh, control points but that's how you do it that's the principle of it so if it's critical or you do it at the start of the project you get your control network you can fly your drone every time because you've got checkpoints that you can prove once it's done the photogrammetry you've got points off site that is your sanity check so you prove you're within tolerance again this is where we say you, you you talk to your customer your client what do they want it for what's their areas what's their tolerances you know because again you don't want a sledgehammer to crack a nut so again if you speak to your consultant or your geospatial guy it's like tell us what you want to do it for and then we can apply various techniques we won't always do a fully controlled adjusted network if you want to spoil heat that's two meters by one meter you know it's it's that would be over the top so we got lots of techniques obviously a survey skill there's redundancies but you'd always use checks post that and then you obviously got the qa post processing um, and qa throughout the project on visual thing and also sanity checks for things like ghosting and um make sure it's on the right grid and that sort of thing but i won't get too technical with that part um because that might bore you a bit <laughs> but rest assured using a geospatial consultant you have got lots you've got the skill set there that understand where errors occur uh, and also subject to what you talk to me about is we can provide the survey that is fit for purpose that's the whole point so i'd like to wrap up by asking you is there any you know you talked we talked about this sort of technology and some really cool stuff any interesting things you've worked on, projects, or anything you're really proud of um, that you've done through Encompass? Well, yes, loads. Um, I've always always been proud in the work we've done. Uh, me personally, when I was sort of actually out on the tools, uh, we've worked for lots of clients, uh, lots of sizes of sites and lots of um, areas. Um, the largest that probably springs to mind is uh, Portland's Park. So when we started 2005 uh, I had a connection and someone called me to say look can you do a bit of topo some guys have already been there but we're coming and do it um, met them 
and in the last 16 years we've done an awful lot so I guess you and probably the, the viewers might have heard of Pepper Pig World that was a massive thing so we undertake sort of their topographical survey so when they were developing their land so when they had the emu fields and stuff like that they've turned that into Pepper Pig World so we did the topo we did the utility um, we set out the rides and how and as Portland's Park have grown they are now theming their areas and I'm not sure if you've been there but you've got Tornado Falls Lost Kingdom so they're they're like Disney-esque areas and what they've done is put lots of family roller coasters in but they're getting bigger and more complex and what we're really proud of and me personally because I, I undertook um, setting out for some of them yeah. in the past is that you know, we're putting the accurate bolt positions and the foundations and the pads and this, that and the other. So we, we did the before element, which is the top and the utility. Then we were setting out the foundations and then we set out the bolts and then suddenly the ride goes up. And that was a really, it's a really cool thing. And um, Touchwood, we've done most of their stuff for the last 16 years and we feel very appreciated that we got a great relationship with them and they trust us to do all their work for them. So that's a fantastic thing and I'm pretty sure they're not finished with what they want to do and it is an awesome park. We've worked for lots of National Trust properties like Petworth House, our park house. So they're really interesting ones. You know, again, when we talk about surveyors, so I'm proud of that because, you know, we trusted them with uh, nationwide companies, well, you know, to do the, the work that they need for them. And that's that's included drone scanning, again, utilities and that aspect. So we're, we're proud of those sort of aspects of it. Uh, it's sort of endless really uh, but I'm proud of almost everything we've done and we've certainly seen plenty of sites over the years uh, and can tell a few stories of occasional mishaps and falling in cesspits and jumping into puddles that we thought was a puddle but actually was a metre deep water uh, and stuff like that so yeah, it's never a dull moment but we're really pleased with all, all those sort of projects we've been dealing with prisons and hospitals and proud to be associated with those really Glenn, thank you for today I found this to be really fascinating. I've learned a lot myself, okay. actually, by asking the questions and listening Good. to your answers. I think also thanks to your mum. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here today, <laughs> would we? So thank you very much. Really appreciate it. And um, great insight into the, the world of surveying. Brilliant. Thanks for having me. So I really hope you found value in this video. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact us. And we really look forward to hearing from you.